Uh, so, so you, you touched on uh, Thomas Pinchon. Pinchon how, um, you, you wrote an essay on him. How, can you summarize your thoughts uh, of him as a writer and why he became the sort of uh, cult literary figure that he became? So Thomas Pinchon was one of these big name uh, writers that I had heard of. Uh, back when I first started Cosmoetica, I had written an essay about uh, a lot of bad writers. Uh, there was a guy who in 01, uh, B, what was his name, BM, BF Myers, I think it was, uh, wrote, uh, you know, an article attacking pretentiousness in writing. And Pinchon was one of his targets. I think Wallace was one of his targets. Don DeLillo was a target. The, the, the woman who wrote the shipping news, um, who, who, de who then did that god-awful Brokeback Mountain shit, uh, one of the worst short stories ever written. And I... <laughs> you just knew it was going to be a terrible film, and it was. But uh, I remember Don Moss, a poet friend of mine, uh, had read Pinchon, and he thought a lot of it was just absolute shit. And uh, it wasn't until, so, oh, however many years, four or five years ago, that I had gotten, I finally decided to get Gravity's Rain, but it was cheap at a used bookstore, three or four bucks for this book. And I read it. And it's basically... Uh, with uh, minor uh, character uh, differences, it's basically it's basically uh, what Vonnegut did in Slaughterhouse Five, and Slaughterhouse Five is one of the great uh, novels of the 20th century. Slaughterhouse Five and Vonnegut is the closest thing to the 20th century's Mark Twain in terms of a humorist, a parodist, and whatnot. Now. Um, that book, Slaughterhouse Five, deals with World War II. It deals with wacky circumstances, characters uh, being humorous unintendedly. But there's a pathos, there's a development of character, and even when you get uh, the the wackiest aspects of it, such as the main character being taken off to another planet and put in a zoo naked with a porno star, uh, it works because we we have seen this character in uh, really uh, uh, debased circumstances, violent circumstances during World War II. We've seen him deal with an insane wife. We've seen him deal with, uh, 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 as he time trips throughout that novel, we've seen him deal with a lot of shit. You don't have that in Gravity's Rainbow. In Gravity's Rainbow, uh, it, th there's some wacky plot. And just to give you an example, off the top of my head, uh, I... I read Gravity's Rainbow full, cover to cover, four or five years ago. The last time I read fully uh, Slaughterhouse Five was maybe not even this century, probably the late 90s. And I, I read it four or five times, probably from when I first read it when I was about 20 to the end of the century. I have watched, the last time I watched the movie of Slaughterhouse Five was maybe about four or five years ago as well. But. I can't, I can't really recall even the plot because there really isn't a plot in, in Gravity's Rainbow. There's some wacky stuff that goes on. There's some spy stuff. There's, uh, the, the title refers to the arc, the parabola of uh, U-2 rockets, I believe. And it, there's a bunch of you know violence and sex and ha, ha, ha. It's trying to be postmodern. And it utterly fails because it doesn't develop the characters. Billy Pilgrim, as wacky of circumstances as you put him in, is a great character because you get the little moments where you're behind his eyes as I've said before you get behind the characters eyes and their eyes worth getting behind because it makes observations there's a there's a well there's a really good scene towards the end of the novel uh, where we see what Billy has said all along that he's going to be murdered by this wacky guy that he was in World War two with on the American side and he, he's, taught, he's giving a talk to like a, a, a friar's organization saying, and you know, there's a man who's crazy and insane and has hated me for the last 30 years and is going to assassinate me uh, uh, tonight and whatnot. And then he does. And, B and then Billy goes back and relives everything again. You don't have that in, in, in Gravity's Rainbow. It's, it's a totally blank, blank slate. And not only that, but on a poetic level in the sentence structure, Vonnegut uses these little rat-a-tat sentences, these little humorous asides. Pinchon will go on with, with, with often these long sentences 
that have no music, there's no alliteration, there's no ass in this, and that's not as important in prose as it is in poetry, but Vonnegut, Vonnegut has a music to his writing. Pinchon is utterly lacking it. And I've seen it, I've also read portions of Mason Dixon, his other big, long book that's uh, often held up as a masterpiece. And uh, I've, I've probably read two or three chapters worth of excerpts from that. And it's pretty much the same crap that's in uh, Gravity's Rainbow. Gravity's Rainbow, though, is a good example, though, uh, versus uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. Slaughterhouse-Five is, in a sense, a non real book. Vonnegut uh, has done other books in that Vonnegutian style. But Vonnegut is non Kareel. There is no other Vonnegut, just like there's no other uh, Mark Twain. That's not to say in, in his later years, uh, Vonnegut, you know, uh, has maybe f four or five great books. And they're usually about 50,000 words. I think Slaughterhouse Five is 50 to 60,000 words. Jessica counted them or, or looked it up. And uh, 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 Gravity's Rainbow is five to six times as long, 330 to 350,000 words. But it, 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 but it doesn't have the poetic punch. It doesn't have the, the depth that uh, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five does. It just, it's just like a big fart. It's just like, it, it, it's like if you had some jello just, just oozing out and, and, and lowering into a swamp. It just goes out and it poisons things around it. And this is why you end up with the David Foster Wallaces. This is why you end up with the James Fries, who is arguably even worse than a Foster Wallace. Um, uh, this is what, how you end up with, as I mentioned, that William Volman or the Dave Eggerses. Uh, and as I said, Vonnegut is non pareil as a writer. When I talk about a, a David Foster Wallace, I could just as easily be talking about, you know, uh, uh, John Chandler Parsons. Well, who's John Chandler Parsons? Do you know? I, I don't, but I'll guarantee you there's someone with three names, pretentiously, who writes just as good or bad as a David Foster Wallace, but didn't get the break. It was, a, just, a, it was just like a lottery, winning a lottery, that David Foster Wallace became David Foster Wallace. Because he, the NFA system that we talked about earlier just spews out this recrudescence of of bad writers that they, they, they want to put into the system. And to speak, speaking of MFAs, that's what they want to do. They want to, to, to get these guys off of uh, an automated uh, uh, production line and just put them out there uh, so to justify you know, conning more suckers. So they have to make stars. A uh, David Foster Wallace and Dave Eggers, who arguably is as bad or worse than Foster Wallace, in a different way, they need to have name stars say, oh, well, you know, da David Foster Wallace or Dave Eggers came through our program, not the college or the university in the next state. He came through uh, Iowa or he came through Ohio State or whatever writing program. Come to us. So they have to make these people stars. And I I'm going to tell you, uh, this, is, this is true with the Pinchons and this is true with the Foster Wallaces and the Eggerses. You always see uh, so and so, the best selling book, right? You know how you get to have a bestseller? It's very simple. To, to be legal, to, to sort of ethically, I don't know if it's legal, but to ethically be able to say that you're a bestseller, you have to appear on the New York Times or one or two other uh, presses or, or organizations' best selling list of the top 50 or top 100. Usually it's the top 100 for one week. If I, if I have the number 97 selling fiction or nonfiction book in one week, I can call it a bestseller. So what happens is, and they, this, is, this is something that MFA programs have practiced, and I have been told this uh, by more than one, uh, not only professor in the system, but certainly by students who have been told to, that when they get something, this is how you should market it, to, so you can slap that on with the presumption being that the word bestseller will feed upon itself. So here's what they do. I write, I write a piece of shit. I spend three, four, five years cobbling shit. David Foster Wallace, for example, infamously wrote 3,000 pages. He just fucking you know, jerked himself off, spewed 3,000 pages of crap. He got editors then, cut it down to 2,000. No, we still don't know what the fuck this is. Well, we're gonna cut it down to 1,000. When we got it down to basically a thousand pages, we put it there. It's still a piece of crap, but we're able to say it's a long piece of crap. 
Now, how do we market this piece of shit? Well, we're going to have to call it a bestseller. Well, you do that in a, in a couple of simple ways. Is You put the book out, and when you put it out there, you, you let it filter out critically for a few weeks. Then after a month or two, when it's been out there, uh, you, you, uh, you have all the books that you're going to, to put out there that have been ordered. But these books that are ordered are books that are ordered by colleges for college libraries. So you have an MFA hack like David Foster Wallace that you want to make a literary star or Eggers a literary star. You don't have to sell a million. You know, people think bestseller means it sold a million copies. You just have to get into that top 100. So in, in the week when you've got all the orders, the pre-orders coming in, uh, and you've got every you know major college, every community college buying two or three books, well, you know, in that one week, you're going to sell, oh, maybe 10, 20, 30,000 copies that you're sending out. These books are discounted. Generally speaking, they're going to be discounted to these MFA things. So if if uh, Infinite Jest sold for thirty dollars hardback when it came out, or, or or whatnot, well, we're going to discount that down to you know half price or you know twenty dollars for you know a discount. That they ship it out all in that one week. Maybe it's Monday to Sunday. I don't know what the parameters are, but they they will ship them out in that one week. And then when you're doing I guess the, the literary equivalent of sound scan or whatever things over the years have been used to track this, you can say, well, look at that. Infinite Jest sold in this week, you know, 38,200 copies. It was the number 68 seller this week. Boy, that means it's a bestseller. Boom, bestseller. You look at all these crap books that come out, and they can be, they can be sci-fi fantasy books and whatnot. Any books now do you see do you see this uh, it's a bestseller crap on you'll you'll see them all over you go to any half price books you go to any uh, Barnes and Noble or whatever chains are left you will see this but it's all a scam it, it's it's a way to market things and so don't don't be fooled into thinking that Dave Eggers is uh, uh, what was it the, the I've got a glorious blow job or whatever the name of it was I, I'm a I'm a living oh, staggering I'm genius. Staggering genius, yeah. 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 Don't 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 think that that really you know they'll they'll say oh it's so it was a bestseller and it's it 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 sold this that or the other thing. Uh, the likelihood is that uh, there was a two or three week period when it first came out that it they just they just over you know they just they just fought. Uh, uh, flowed everything into that week and put it out in one week to get that that official thing that they could say, well, we're not lying. Look at this. In uh, October of 2000 or 2001, whenever that book came out, I mean, he, you know, Dave Eggers, it, it was a top 25. It was the number 23 bestseller. Now, of course, the number, now this is not to say that uh, the stuff ahead of it, you know, the 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 romance crap, the the, the Harry Potter kind of crap, this other kind of crap, which isn't uh, is any better, really, but uh, they at least legitimately are selling books. People are buying this lowest common denominator crap. The MFA programs figured out though that's how to make stars, because we, you know, you're not going to sell Infinite Jest, even if it was a, a great marvelous book. You're not going to have someone read a thousand-page great book. And that's going to sell as much as you know Harry Potter, and I'm going to wiggle the piggle the and oh, I'm going to the the fuck faces of Dartmoor. I'm going to oh Harry Potter versus this. They're not going to no 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 one's going to you know read that shit. They're not going to read you know Hunger Games 17. You know the Fire God sucks ass. You know that no no one that's going to always outsell the crap from uh, uh, the M crowds. But that's how they came the system.